Good evening. Welcome to today's webinar and thank you for joining. My name is Louise King and I'm your host this evening. Our expert presenters are Eddie Chaloner and Aaron Sweeney. Today's present presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can ask questions throughout the webinar using the questions panel at the bottom of your screen or you can save them up until the end. You can ask these anonymously by ticking the anonymous box. Now, if you don't, your, your name will be shown, um, but I would only use your first name. But please note this is recorded, so your name will be seen for others looking at the Q&A session in future. I will now hand over to Mr Chandler. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Louise, and uh, thanks to everybody for uh, tuning into uh, this webinar this evening. Um, Aaron and I have um, done dozens and dozens of uh, lectures about varicose veins over the years, but we've never done one in this style. So uh, I hope it goes okay, um, and that you can all hear us and see the slides. Uh, as Louise says, any questions we're happy to take at the end of the presentation. Uh, no, I can see the technology will uh, work and let me advance to the next screen. So here at Benenden Hospital, Aaron and I have been um, providing the vein service now for, uh, I think this is our ninth year. Uh, and um, during that time, uh, we've developed the service quite substantially. Uh, the majority of our cases are done um, by using the endovenous laser, uh, which when we started using it in 2003 was a revolutionary technique, um, but has now become the gold standard for treating varicose veins, uh, not just in the UK, but more or less across the world. Uh, being on the front of the curve, as far as the technology adoption was concerned, uh, gave us a, a pretty good uh, early experience and allowed us to refine the technique um, pretty successfully. So now more or less 90% of uh, varicose vein cases can be performed using the laser or adjunctive minimally invasive techniques. And the majority of cases can be done under local anaesthetic uh, without the need to put people to sleep. Now that's both an advantage and a disadvantage in some respects. Most people prefer local anaesthetic, um, but it, it's a bit like going to the dentist. Uh, nobody particularly enjoys having a load of injections and we do take certain steps to make that easier for people, but the benefits are uh, substantial being able to do uh, walk-in, walk-out treatment uh, without the need to keep people in hospital uh, or put them to sleep. Um, at Benenden, we do a lot of things. We uh, were quite gratified to note that uh, we are the largest single centre uh, in the UK for doing vein surgery. We perform somewhere between 800 and 1,000 cases a year. Um, on a normal year. Uh, this year has been anything but normal, obviously, um, but, but we are slowly getting back to something like our normal practice. Aaron will say quite a bit more about that uh, when uh, he, he does his bit. Um, so I'm now going to talk about what varicose veins are and um, how they present. So normally, um, veins can't really be seen when they're functioning normally in the leg. Uh, you can see small blue marks on, on your skin, particularly if you're pale Northern European, um, but they're more or less invisible. Uh, unfortunately, when the valves in the veins start to fail, uh, the peripheral veins, the, the ones that are just underneath the skin, start to swell as they become engorged with blood under high pressure. And people notice that by lumpy purple or blue bulging veins visible on the surface of the skin. As well as the cosmetic appearance, most people tend to notice symptoms of aching heaviness and, and swelling of the, of the legs and ankles, particularly toward the end of the day if they've been standing up a long time. And also particularly in hot weather, and this is caused by, by the blood being under higher pressure in the vein as a consequence of valve failure. Uh, symptoms of cramp, bursting, throbbing, swelling are often reported. And the next step is that the 
veins, if they're varicose veins for a long period of time, and I'm talking about many years here, uh, start to develop uh, irritation of the skin, usually around the lower parts of the ankle on the inside. And this firstly presents itself as tiny little venous uh, blowouts, uh, little purple veins on the surface of the skin, and then progresses to a discoloration, or usually a brown discoloration of the skin associated with dryness and itchiness. And if it goes on for long enough, it can cause skin breakdown into a thing called a venous ulcer, uh, which is something to be avoided. So we just go through the different types or, or the severity of veins in the next few slides, you'll be able to see what I mean by all that. So this first picture shows what we call a type one uh, vein, which are the little uh, cutaneous uh, blemishes, uh, blue, purple, or red, uh, sometimes called spider veins or thread veins or reticular veins. And these are mainly of cosmetic significance. They're not usually symptomatic, they don't create aching or throbbing in the same way as the larger veins do. Um, and they can be treated quite simply with injections to improve the cosmetic appearance. Aaron might say more about that later on. These are type two veins, and you can see they're slightly raised from the skin, but they're not terribly large, and they're not associated with any deeper valve uh, malfunction. Um, again, they, they very rarely cause significant symptoms. Uh, they're relatively minor problems, and they can either be treated by injections or by just physically removing them uh, to make them look a bit better. Again, mostly type two, mostly cosmetic significance. Type three is the commonest type of proper varicose vein. Around about 50% of varicose veins are what we call type three. And you can see here on the surface of the leg, there are some quite large, twisted, tortuous, bulging veins. And this is um, the, the type of vein which causes symptoms of aching, throbbing, swelling, discomfort uh, for most patients. There are, broadly speaking, there are two ways of treating this type of problem. Uh, you can either have an operation, which is generally the preferred option, or if you're um, not keen on having an operation or not technically suitable. Now, these can be treated with compression stockings. Now, I mentioned compression stockings really mostly to dismiss them for most patients. They do work in the sense that if people wear them, uh, they will compress the veins and improve the symptoms, but they don't cure the underlying cause. And the practicalities of such, that they're so uncomfortable to get on, um, and to take off and indeed to wear during the course of the day, particularly if the weather's hot. But the vast majority of patients can't really tolerate them in the long term. And the surgery is the preferred option, particularly as our techniques now are so much better than they were when Aaron and I were young surgeons. Um, so for the vast majority of patients with type three veins and above, uh, surgery is usually preferable uh, because the results are um, so good. Uh, the next stage is um, of stage four, and you can just see on this slide that over the bulging uh, veins here, there's a starting to become a, a change in the skin color, uh, which is uh, usually itchy uh, and sometimes inflamed. <clears throat> so type four veins are starting to become a serious medical problem. Type four veins are characterized by this, this sort of skin damage, and also by conditions such as superficial thromboflebitis. What that means is that in each of these bulging varicosities, the wall of the vein on the inside becomes rough, and this causes the blood to clot. Patients experience that as, as an inflammatory condition with a, with a sudden uh, manifestation of a hard, tender lump on the leg, uh, which takes um, about two weeks to settle down on its own, but frequently recurs. And uh, this is a, an independent risk factor for the more serious DVT or deep vein thrombosis, um, which is a much more serious 
medical problem. So by the time your veins get to stage four, they really need to be treated uh, to prevent um, serious problems occurring in the future. So stage five and stage six are really getting quite gnarly. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side here, stage five, this is what we call pre-ulcerous. So the skin has become quite badly damaged. Uh, it's, it's heavily pigmented, quite thin, probably itchy. And, and just at the middle, <clears throat> there's the starting point of a skin breakdown, which eventually, if untreated, will lead to type six, which is on the right-hand side, where you've got a full thickness breakdown of the skin and a large venous ulcer. Now, it's important to say that this doesn't happen overnight. This progression through the stages from stage three to stage six often takes many, many years, sometimes decades. Um, so if you've got varicose veins, uh, which are relatively modest, uh, you're not suddenly going to wake up one morning with a venous ulcer. You'll get plenty of, of advanced warning um, about that process and have plenty of time to uh, get something done about it. But untreated, around about a third of patients suffering with varicose veins for a long period of time do progress to stage five or stage six. And the problem, uh, once you get to this point, is that whilst a venous ulcer can be healed, uh, and we do heal uh, lots of them, uh, it takes a great deal of time and effort to get this thing sorted out. It requires a combination of um, many weeks of uh, an extensive uh, compression bandaging done twice a week by a skilled nurse, uh, usually in conjunction with surgery uh, to get the venous ulcer like this healed up. And on occasions, uh, we, we need to put skin grafts on them as well. Uh, and sometimes uh, once they've been uh, established for a long period of time, they become so chronic that they never heal at all. So it's a real source of disability um, and for particularly older people. Uh, and the, the solution to, or the best way of treating a venous ulcer is not to get one in the first place. Uh, fortunately, um, prompt surgery uh, when it's at stage three or stage four uh, will prevent further progression to this sort of skin damage and eventual ulceration. And now I'm going to hand over to Erin, who's going to talk in a little more detail about the types of techniques we use these days in modern venous practice to um, prevent this sort of thing from happening, uh, to make people's legs feel better, and uh, let's face it, to make them look better as well. So I'm now going to turn my microphone off and hand over to Aaron. Hello there. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, when you come and see us, we normally will do a, an ultrasound scan, uh, and that's really to see inside your leg, uh, because it is often quite surprising that uh, very small veins uh, on the surface can actually be fed by a much larger vein that normally runs up the inside of your leg, and it can be the size of your thumb. It should be a very small thing that's uh, smaller than, the, uh, than a shoelace. However, if the valves break, this vein gets a little bit bigger and at various parts of your leg, the uh, little branches come up on the surface and then you see some varicose veins. There are loads of treatments available. It used to be that uh, people had cuts in their legs and their veins pulled out. And that was called stripping. That was a reasonable uh, treatment when there was nothing else available. But uh, for the past, 20 years or so, new techniques have appeared. We commonly use a laser, and that's not a James Bond type procedure that you may have seen a Goldfinger. Uh, this is a small laser, it looks like a little wire. Uh, we thread it up the inside of your vein, and we use the heat from the laser to uh, seal the vein. So instead of pulling veins out, we damage them from the inside and this uh, essentially stops the problem. There are a number of different ways, uh, different techniques. And when you look online, normally uh, huge numbers of different techniques, but they're more or less uh, the same. There are 
uh, treatments where you pass something up the inside of a vein and you use heat to damage the vein. And that can be a laser, uh, it can be electricity or a microwave treatment. And various companies describe that in different ways, call it radiofrequency ablation, um, for example. Uh, but most of these either use a, a laser heat or electricity as a heat source. There are some chemical techniques as well. Uh, they're generally not quite so good. Uh, and they in, involve, instead of giving a uh, heat uh, injury to the inside of the vein, uh, we pass a small chemical up the inside and that gives a chem chemical damage to the inside lining of the vein. Uh, we prefer to use a laser because its results are really quite impressive. Uh, for most people, the recurrence rate is really tiny. We would normally tell people that after having their vein treated with a laser, the risk of a recurrence is about 1%. However, you do have approximately a 10% chance of another vein on that leg or the other leg uh, becoming varicosed uh, over the following decades, usually. So, so for most people, when they have their veins treated with a laser, that's the end of their problem. Uh, but it does involve a little bit of discomfort. Uh, again, online, people often uh, focus uh, on the lack of pain involved in having varicose veins treated. I would say that it is a little bit like going to the dentist. It's probably as stressful. The injections that we use for local anesthesia are much less painful than those the dentists give. and after the operation itself may take 20 to 30 minutes. And afterwards, I think most people feel like they've pulled a muscle. Uh, for guys, we usually tell them it's uh, like the first football match of the year. And often people will take uh, Nurofen or whatever your favorite painkiller is just to keep things going for the first few days. In general, people can go back to work the next day, but I would say most people take it easy. Uh, for a day or two. And afterwards, we put you in a bandage uh, and that stays on normally for between three and five days. It sometimes can be a little uncomfortable, so people take it off a little earlier. It's not a great uh, problem taking the, um, the bandage off. It's a non-stick type bandage. It's a bit like Velcro. And um, we don't ask people to wear compression stockings afterwards because we find that Either people find them too hard to put on uh, or they, um, they're too tight or too inconvenient. And they often produce far more trouble than if you just leave them off uh, completely. Um, when you come and see us, as I say, we do, take, um, do do an ultrasound scan in clinic. The consultation takes about 20 minutes or so. Uh, the re when we talk to you about the various techniques that you can have, we're really trying to find the uh, tailor it to you. Uh, and to make sure that it produces the minimum amount of discomfort. And of course, our uh, main priority is never to give you a uh, complication that causes you trouble in the future. Um, as uh, we have said already, the surgery is usually done as a day case. So you walk in, uh, walk out, you do need a lift home afterwards. Uh, sometimes people uh, have, for various reasons, difficulties in that. So occasionally people will have a general anesthetic that's for people who uh, maybe find it very difficult or stressful. But for most people, uh, they come in and go out. And if we happen to do uh, two legs, they are often a little stressed with the first leg. Uh, but in general, when they come back for the second treatment, uh, they are much more relaxed uh, and realize it's not quite as uh, uh, troublesome as they may have expected. So this picture uh, is kind of the best picture we could produce really. Uh, so if you could see on the left-hand side of the screen, it's a typical varicose vein. When we do treatment, uh, we after lasering, we don't necessarily remove every single vein in your leg. Um, and it normally takes a couple of weeks for the veins to, to go flat. About six weeks afterwards though, you get the full effect. Um, so that, this is kind of the best picture we have. So uh, if you have larger veins, it sometimes takes a little longer. Um,
Yeah, so the main, main thing to take from this is that it's a relatively straightforward procedure. It is a little stressful. Uh, most people walk in, walk out the door. In general, people go back to work as quickly as they wish. I would say that most people don't drive for the first few days. Most people find the bandage a little uncomfortable. Um, and I think it takes around about a week to go back to the gym and maybe two weeks to run properly. Uh, I normally tell people it takes between two and three weeks for you to forget that you've ever had an operation and for your legs to feel uh, much better. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chandler and Mr. Sweeney. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. OK, so we have a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, but please, everyone listening, please do ask any question you have, no matter how silly you might think they are. I'm sure they're not. Um, any questions? Um, so, the first question I have is, I've had two operations to strip veins in the 1980s. Does this affect further treatment? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> the answer is it depends. Um, for primary uh, patient cases, so veins that haven't been operated on before, um, the sort of treatments that Aaron was describing, uh, the, the EVLT laser and so on, uh, are, are almost uh, are applicable in almost 100% of patients. Um, for people who've had previous surgery and so have what we call recurrent veins, uh, that changes slightly. And it's very difficult to tell without examining the patient and most importantly, doing an ultrasound scan. Um, having said that, uh, over the years, the proportion of patients with recurrent veins who are suitable for minimally invasive treatment has increased substantially. When we started out doing this operation, only around about 50% of people with recurrent veins could be treated with lasering or similar techniques. Now it's more like 80%. So, uh, and the other thing is we've, we've got more options now um, in our, in our um, techniques. Uh, so it's very, very unusual that a patient, even with recurrent varicose veins after multiple previous surgeries, can't have a minimally invasive style of treatment, um, usually under local anaesthetic, uh, without the need to have a, a massive cut in the leg or or go through prolonged uh, surgical treatment like used to, used to happen in the past. Um, so in general terms, uh, we can usually do something beneficial. Uh, we can rarely make it perfect, but we can all improve it in almost all cases. Um, and for the vast majority of people, we can do it with minimally invasive methods. Thank you. Okay, next question. What are the benefits of varicose vein treatment at a hospital instead of a clinic? Uh, I might answer that one. Um, really, it's uh, we feel it's a safety issue, actually. Um, we find that uh, in many clinics, uh, I think, push uh, for a particular type of surgery. Um, and sometimes you can uh, be in a clinic that's really just a simple room uh, in a building and I think it is much nicer to be in a hospital setting and that's really for any kind of reactions you might have to a drug uh, and also from a sterility and um, cleanliness point of view. Uh, I know in Benedon everyone is checked including the staff uh, for COVID before any uh, treatments begin uh, but also there's a great deal of expertise in a hospital and there's often a larger number of people. So I would I always prefer to, uh, if I'm doing operations, I would much prefer to uh, do it in a, in a hospital rather than in a uh, room in a clinic, uh, for example. Yeah, I guess also a, a hospital like ours is um, rated outstanding by the CQC. So um, especially right now, it's really nice to know that we do have such cleanliness state, you know, um, measurements in place, and we do have a 0% MRSA as well. It's always very good to know. Um, 
Next question, can I exercise or slash walk the dog soon after an operation? Um, yes, more or less directly, actually. Most people can walk the dog the next day. Um, it's the majority of patients are surprised uh, in the day or two after uh, laser treatment, how little pain they have. And, and part of that's because of the bandage that's put on, uh, which is a bit inconvenient, but most people can walk pretty normally, uh, more or less straight away. Uh, the worst bit uh, after surgery is usually when the bandage comes off at about five days. And that's when patients usually get a bit of tightness in the thigh or in the lower part of the leg. Um, and as Aaron was saying, that, that will stop you uh, going to the gym or, or riding a bike mm. for a few days. Um, but for the majority of patients, um, that feeling of tightness and soreness uh, lasts from about day five, maybe to day 10. Um, and by day 10, it's more or less resolved. And most people are pretty much back to normal. So yeah, the straight answer, as far as the dog is concerned, uh, that you can walk the dog pretty much straight away. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, Susan asks, why would you be offered chemical rather than, than laser treatment? Uh, it depends really. Um, usually it's because, uh, I can't say usually. Sometimes it's because the person offering the treatment uh, hasn't done many laser treatments. Uh, the other reason is that chemical, which is normally foam injected up your leg, is actually a very easy treatment. Uh, it can be done in outpatients. You don't need to go to a hospital necessarily to have that done. Uh, I find though that it produces quite a lot of complications such as skin um, damage and sometimes skin staining. Uh, so when people use a chemical, I'm always a little bit careful because you are injecting something inside. It is producing a reaction inside your um, leg. And so for that reason, I tend not to favor it. Uh, when you use a laser or an electric uh, wire, uh, you're actually just producing heat. There's no chemicals going into your body as such. Um, but on certain circumstances, um, chemical treatments are actually very good. So sometimes with recurrent veins, we use uh, foam uh, or another chemical to treat them. So the whole idea with us is to stop us doing lots of incisions and pulling veins out. So most times we can treat the vein with a laser. Sometimes we do use a, a chemical as well. So it is quite nice to, when you see whoever you see, that they are able to offer everything. Um, rather than push you one, uh, one way or the other. I hope that answers that. I think so. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Sonia. She asks, do you do treatment for just spider veins? Yes, we do. Um, we do quite a lot of that. And um, there are several different treatments you can use for, for spider veins or thread veins. The, the commonest one and the one we, we prefer is using injection sclerotherapy. Uh, which is a chemical-based technique, as Aaron was just saying, and uh, is one of the indications we think that that, uh, that that's the best option um, for the little thread veins uh, to get them <clears throat> to shrivel up and eventually go away. Uh, it's important to say, though, that that um, it's it's rare to uh, create, uh, you know, make somebody's leg look like a marble statue. Um, again, when you when you read what some people write about injection sclerotherapy for thread veins, you'd think it was some sort of magic trick. It, it isn't. Um, it's, it's a very useful technique done properly in, uh, in the right way, but it does give you a certain amount of bruising um, and, and brown marks on the skin where the vein was uh, for somewhere between eight to 12 weeks. So for that reason, uh, patients who are coming for thread vein treatment often like to have it in the autumn or winter time. And if they, if they turn up in June, um, asking, asking us to get rid of their veins so they can go on the beach in July, um, I'm afraid that's unrealistic. Um, so uh, the short answer to the question is yes, we do an awful lot of injection sclerotherapy and it works pretty well. Um, most people get a good result, um, but unfortunately uh, it, it, it's, it's, we're unlikely to be able to put you back on the catwalk uh, or turn you into a marble statue. <laughs> 
Okay, that's a good answer and also quite relevant for me. Thank you. Um, okay, we have an anonymous question and the question is, can varicose veins come back after treatment? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, and it all depends um, what treatment you have. Uh, so some are better than others, uh, but also we don't actually know the reason why people develop varicose veins in the first place. We know it's to do with gravity and standing all day, and humans are the only people who, only animal who gets uh, varicose veins, uh, but we don't actually know the exact cause. Now, that means that whatever treatment you have, and it can be wonderful, and work wonderfully, but another vein in your body can actually um, become varicosed. So you can develop new varicose veins. One of the problems in the past was that when people had their veins stripped, they nearly always recurred. And that was because when you pulled a vein out, your body tried to heal itself and produce new veins that weren't normal. Uh, and they often became varicosed. And sometimes you would hear stories of your granny having an operation and then having worse veins a few months later. That kind of scenario doesn't really happen with uh, laser treatments. Um, the vein, once you laser it, has absolutely disappears. So you can tell people that it's 100% uh, successful or almost, uh, but that doesn't stop new varicose veins appearing. And most people we see are, uh, they come to us the first time and they say, will I be back to see you again? And I say, there's a probable 10% chance that another vein will go in either that leg or the other leg, but it's very unlikely to be the vein that you come to see us uh, with. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, Karen asks, please can you give me the approximate cost for treatment of varica veins if they're not advanced? Um, well, that rather depends on, um, on the circumstances. Uh, ben and the members, uh, I think as provided by the society, similarly were for um, uh, people who are insured with other providers. Um, for patients who are self-funding, it really depends on the size of the problem. And uh, in order to assess that, um, one needs to do a proper consultation and scans. And then following on from that, the hospital uh, can give people a quote as to the cost uh, for whatever treatment is required. As a rough guide, and I, I, and I, I, I don't hold me to this because I'm, I'm pretty bad at, uh, at these types of estimates. Um, as a rough guide, it's somewhere between two and a half to three thousand pounds. I think, um, to, to get one leg done. Um, but the, the hospital um, costs it up on an individual basis. Uh, once a patient's seen Aaron or myself, and we've um, uh, interpreted what, what we need to do, and, and then the hospital translates that into a cost uh, for a self-pay package. Am, am I right in that for you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, our next question is from Oliver. How quickly could I be seen and how would I book an appointment? Um, well, there are two or three clinics per week available in uh, Benedon. Uh, so the simple answer to that is you can be seen either the same week you ring up or the following week afterwards. Um, in terms of operations, it really depends when you want to have it done. Uh, most people, I think, have their procedures done within a few weeks. Um, I think so. Very rare, but there's no waiting list as such. Uh, so there is always gaps in the clinic. Uh, who, when people ring up, they can uh, be immediately put on a on a clinic list. Uh, you can, I believe, ring directly Benenden Hospital and be put through to the person who is uh, dedicated at uh, giving you an outpatient appointment. Thank you. We have another anonymous question, and it seems to be someone who has some understanding of um, the way veins work. Um, the question is, after removing the function of a part of a vein, an affected vein, is there any way to prevent extra stress on the collateral veins? Or is it considered that the varicose vein is so affected that it can't safely deal with the blood traveling through it anyway? Um, yeah, there's no real downside to getting rid of a varicose vein. Um, they're not, they're not um, functional, they're not, they're not uh, contributing anything to 
the flow of blood out of the leg. And um, sometimes we're asked, uh, would it be a problem if we if you needed a, a vein for a heart bypass, um, if you'd had them removed because they were varicose? And the answer to that is no, because the varicose vein itself, uh, because it's so damaged by being stretched, is unsuitable for use as a coronary graft or, or as, a, as a conduit for any other type of surgical bypass procedure. So as my mother used to say, it's neither use nor ornament. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's functionally irrelevant and it doesn't look very nice. So getting rid of it doesn't inconvenience you. Um, there are one or two technical exceptions to that general rule. Um, and that usually is where a patient has had very extensive DVT, deep vein thrombosis in the past, um, because sometimes patients who've had very, very extensive deep vein damage um, actually rely on varicose veins to allow the blood to get out of the leg. And, uh, and that's one of the um, important reasons that, that, that the cases are properly assessed by a surgeon who is familiar with, with vein surgery in the widest sense. Uh, because that's the sole and relatively rare occasion where you can actually make somebody worse by operating on their veins uh, rather than making them better. So that's really to be avoided. And the best way of avoiding that pitfall um, is to know about it um, and to consider it um, when, you, when you see the patient. Right, thank you. Just, I've got a few more questions. Um, Another anonymous one, if varicose veins reappear after treatment, do they tend to be as severe as the ones they've already been treated? Uh, no, is the usual answer to that. Uh, we would normally tell people less than 1% of people come back within the first year with a uh, varicose vein where they had one previously. Occasionally, people do develop one nearby. Uh, and they're normally really small and can be treated with a small amount of uh, foam or an injection. Uh, on the very rare occasions when veins come back quickly, that's because we haven't done it correctly and uh, haven't given you enough uh, laser energy, for example. And that is incredibly rare. Uh, for, and, and so when you have a scan before you have your operation, we work out which vein is not working correctly. That's the one that we treat. Uh, we don't treat veins that look normal, uh, so very occasionally one of those can start to appear uh, within a few months of an operation, but normally it's small and can be treated with simple injection. It's really rare for us to have to uh, bring someone back to uh, an operating theatre uh, twice within a year. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, if after the ultrasound you find the veins are larger than they appear from the outside, would you suggest a general anaesthetic? Um, that really rather depends on the circumstances. Um, the, the, the run of the mill uh, condition uh, is that no, that's, that's not necessary. The, the, uh, the criteria for um, suggesting a general anaesthetic is usually more on patient preference than on um, technical aspects uh, around the, the, the anatomy of the case. Uh, so, and, and as Aaron said, that, that's, that's often patients who are very, very nervous about having a local anaesthetic uh, and just prefer to be asleep. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, and some patients are more comfortable doing it that way. Uh, there are one or two technical circumstances where uh, we recommend a general anaesthetic based on um, the ultrasound and clinical assessment. And that's usually in quite complicated cases um, where we're going to have to do um, quite a lot of work and probably make some small incisions. Um, and, and on the basis of what we know we can safely and comfortably do under local anaesthetic, for a technically very difficult case, sometimes we're we think we're gonna push the envelope there. And, and rather than um, have a patient be uncomfortable on the local anesthetic table, um, we think it's, it's preferable to, to go for general anesthetic um, uh, in the first instance. 
And that's quite uncommon. I'd, I'd say as a rough guide, maybe that's one case a year um, out of, out of uh, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 that we do at Benenden. So the majority of cases that, that we do under general anaesthetic um, are on the basis of patient choice rather than surgery choice. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, just two more questions now. Um, one from Irina. Um, are there any dietary and lifestyle advice, I guess, before or after surgery? And how much do hormones and therefore pregnancy affect the formation of varicose veins? Um, well, the pregnancy issue is, uh, is quite interesting. He, girls produce a hormone called progesterone. It goes uh, very high in the last three months of pregnancy. And it also gets a spike just before a uh, period time. Uh, progesterone relaxes things to allow baby to pop out, uh, but it also relaxes varicose veins. So it is high. Some poor girls have a truly miserable time with varicose veins and hemorrhoids and swollen ankles uh, during the last uh, trimester. And indeed why sometimes people notice their ankles will swell uh, just before they're having, uh, having a period. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have varicose veins, uh, but it's just your veins have become more relaxed. So what that means is that uh, hormones play a, a role in the symptoms of varicose veins. Uh, heat plays a role. So in summertime, people often get much more painful veins because they're, they have dilated. Uh, this time of year, especially this week, most people with varicose veins have no trouble at all because there's not much blood going to their skin. Uh, so their veins tend to be a little smaller. Uh, and there are treatments for, uh, where in, the, um, in Holland and Barrett, for example, where you can get red vine leaf and I think it's horse chestnut. And they do seem to reduce a little symptoms people get uh, with varicose vein, veins, but there's no real medication that's going to cure them. They're a very... They're a mechanical problem. There's a valve that's broken. It's allowing blood to go in the wrong direction down your leg, filling up uh, the vein under your, under the skin. And it's that filling of the vein that gives you the throbbing and the ache and fills up your skin and makes it a little bit more itchy than it should be. Um, but in general, uh, if you look at when people come to us, girls tend to come slightly quicker than, uh, although, you know, it's still a 50-50 split more or less, but girls tend to come because they have had a miserable time either in the last few months of pregnancy um, or around period time. And uh, that uh, ache is what prompts them to come usually 10 years before men come, uh, but they come with the same symptoms, throbbing and ache. It just happens to be a little bit later in life. Thank you. Um, our last question is from Jenny. And she asked, would thread veins be treated at the same time as the fat, bobbly ones? <laughs> um, well, the answer to that is they can be, but we usually don't. Um, and, and the reason for that is that um, uh, thread veins are uh, often seen in, in conjunction with uh, fat, bobbly veins, or what, what we would call proper varicose veins. Um, and that normally when you've treated the underlying uh, what we call venous reflux, the, the damaged uh, valves, um, the, the, the whole system decompresses and quite a few of the thread veins will just recede um, just having done that. So generally the way we do it is that we, we treat the big problem first and then we let everything settle down for a few weeks and you sometimes find that when you're then going into the tidying up phase of dealing with the thread veins, you've got a lot less to do than you would, ha would have otherwise. Um, there's very little point um, in treating thread veins on their own if, if varicose veins are already present because you just don't get a good enough result and the, the thread veins keep coming back. So the order of, of batting, if you like, is to deal with the, the, the big problem first. Um, that will, in turn, uh, reduce the number of thread veins and then you don't have to do quite so much sclerotherapy treatment afterwards um, to arrive at the optimal cosmetic result. Great, thank you very much. That's the end of today's um, presentation and Q&A session. 
So I'd just like to say thank you very much, Mr. Shamner and Mr. Sweeney. It's been really interesting. I hope everyone yeah. watching has found it of use. <laughs> So thank you. Um, our audience, you will receive a short survey afterwards. Um, we're really grateful if you could spare a few minutes to just respond to that. It just helps um, shape our future webinars. Um, our next event will be on the 6th of March, and that's with Mr. Le Liam Stapleton, and it'll be on podiatry. Um, so on behalf of uh, Mr. Shannon and Mr. Sweeney and everyone at Benden Hospital and everyone at our technical team behind the scenes, I'd like to say thank you this evening um, and thank you for joining us and um, we'll see you soon. So thanks very much and goodbye.